Hey, buddy. Same thing we do every day. Working on cars, working on our projects. Sometimes we're cutting metal. Sometimes we're welding it. Sometimes we're working on our Jeeps. Hey, what are you building right there? This is a Lego Ninjago little car in a wheel. Oh, man, that's a great way to learn how to build stuff. Working on Legos, right? Okay. This is Kai from Ninjago. Hey, cool. Look this is one of our projects we're working on today. He's the elemental matchup. And here's Chloe. Hey, do we want to invite everybody to stop by our channel, E Doggy's Garage? Yes. Okay, we do. So let's tell them right now. Hey, if you want to see what's going on on E Doggy's Garage, you need to subscribe and like our channel. Right, E Doggy? Yo, we can hit. That's right. We got plenty of projects going on. We got lots happening. So and stop you by know what to do. Watch this video. Watch them. All right, uh, finishing up at the water jetter. We, uh, we got our parts, so uh, we'll go home, we'll make some stuff, and uh, you know, it's really nice to know people. And uh, you know, part of getting a lot of this stuff done is the network of people that you have that can help you to do projects. So I say, expand your network. All right, we just left the water jet, and we are headed to Liberty Sandblasting in Benton, Missouri. We've used these guys for years. They're under new ownership. They just sandblasted our nine inch Ford rear end for the 65 Mustang. This will be the first time that we've used them under new ownership. They have always taken good care of us in the past. Uh, they good timely turnaround. They treat us right on price. So we'll see how this goes, but we're headed there to pick up that rear end. And then we're gonna drop it off at Powder Coat later on this afternoon while I'm on my way to go in for overtime at work. Got our rear end sandblasted. We went ahead and it's a rainy day, so we covered it with plastic. Uh, now we're departing Liberty Sandblasting. They did a great job. Our rear end back from a sandblaster and in preparation for powder coat. A couple things that I do whenever I send one out for sandblasting is on these rear ends, you've got surfaces that you do not want to get sandblasted. So what I do is I'll make, I'll make a plate that goes over where the bearing retainer is and it protects that surface from getting all beat up by the sandblast media. Another thing that happens when they're at the sandblaster or media blaster, depends on, you know, a lot of times they don't use sand, they'll use uh, little metal balls, but different types of media, regardless what you're doing, that stuff is going to get all over everything. And in the case of a rear end housing, it's going to get inside of it. 
and you want to make sure that you clean this out really well before you put it into use because again you have bearings and you know your ring and pinion you definitely don't want sand getting in between where those gears mesh the other thing too is be very careful what you touch the housing with you don't want any water to get on it you don't want any oil and then depending i like to wear jersey gloves when i'm around the shop the problem with jersey gloves are whenever you touch something that's been newly sandblasted it'll leave little pieces of the fabric kind of hung in the tooth that is created by the sandblasting media so you want to be careful with that because that will end up in your coating, whatever it is. Especially powder coat because, you know, powder coat, you can't really sand and knock any dust out of it or anything like that. So you wanna be careful what comes in contact with the housing. One thing that I found on this one is where our drain plug is. I left that drain plug in and I did try to clean the inside of the housing to make sure that we didn't have a bunch of oil or anything, but I can see where that oil has kind of seeped out between the threads and the plug, and that is on the surface where our powder coat's gonna be. So I'll have to make sure I clean that up. So, this is what was in that axle tube right here. This was what is in that axle tube where I took that cover off. So there's still a lot of media and this media is steel media it's really small little pieces of steel ball and we're using big we're using what they call torino or big bearings on this housing that's one of the things that i installed on this because we changed uh bearing housings on this when we went to the bigger axles so and that's just an aluminum plate that i made that goes over the end of that bearing retainer that flange your eyes when you do this because I just hit that the end of that retainer and it blew all kinds of media back in my face. Like everything that we do, the most important thing about any project is the person that's doing it. So you want to make sure that you're always safe. You want to go, you know, you want to have all your toys, toes and fingers, eyeballs, everything at the end of your project so that you can have fun with whatever you're working on. Put a rubber plug in our fill bung uh, because of the cap I, I didn't send the cap to the sandblaster because it's already in good shape it's a aluminum cap so uh, I put a, a plug in there to not tear up the threads they're not going to get powder coated and we don't want them to get sandblasted as I mentioned you can see a little bit of where that oil gear lube would have came out of the threads of that plug. I probably should have took that plug out and uh, cleaned all that up, but I was using it as thread protection. So, you know, double-edged sword right there. Other than clean up a little bit of that oil around that plug, it's cleaned up enough, it's blown out enough that I can send it to, sand, to the powder coater. They're gonna do a little bit of clean up on it themselves. I'm sure they'll, they'll just check and make sure that their stuff's gonna stick. 
So this is ready to go to the powder coater. Once it's back from powder coat and we're gonna assemble it, we're gonna clean it really, really well. We'll actually kind of clean it like a gun barrel with a rag and then clean around the inside. We did a pretty good job of cleaning it before we sent it to the sandblaster because any of that oil that sits inside that housing is gonna grab media. So you wanna make sure it's kind of clean. All right, so we've got our nine inch Ford rear end all cleaned up. I was supposed to drop it off at the powder coaters yesterday. That didn't work out. Uh, so we're gonna try to drop it off today. And then some of the other stuff that occurred was we got the engine out to the guy who's gonna dyno it for us. And you can think that you're ready. You can think you got all, everything in place and something will always come up. Well. We had a few things come up that we didn't think of, and one of them was really stupid. So we, when we dynoed the engine the first time out in Atlanta, we looked over some of the video and a couple things that we noticed uh, that we didn't want to do wrong on this dyno session was um, we wanted to be able to monitor more stuff. So we're going to dyno the engine this time on a dyno that can measure every possible parameter that you would like to measure. And that's just for information that Tony wants to have uh, as far as the way the engine is performing. But a couple things that we figured out once we got out to the new place was when we dynoed the engine the first time, there was no crankcase ventilation on the engine which is gonna hurt you horsepower wise. So we ended up putting a fitting in the valley, in the, in the lifter valley, so that we could put a, something on it for crankcase ventilation. So that might help us just right there. But then a couple other things that occurred to us when we were standing there looking at the engine, one of them was the engine didn't have oil in it. We had drained the oil out because of some things that we were gonna do. So we tell Chris, the guy that's gonna dyno it, hey man, don't spin this thing because it's got no oil in it. He says, well, do you have oil? And we do, we brought oil with us. And we get to looking, there's no way to put oil in the engine because the valve covers that we switch to are these cast valve covers. And there's two of them, they're identical. And there's no way to put, there's no way to put oil in them. So we thought, well, we'll just take a valve cover off and we'll dump oil in it for the dyno session. But we ran into the, we ran into the problem where we needed to make more stuff to make the dyno session work. Uh, so I brought the thing home. I stopped by Speed Custom Performance SCP right here in High Ridge and picked up a Moroso aluminum uh, fill bung and cap. So we are going to use our drill press and a hole saw to poke a hole in this and then we'll weld it up on our Dynasty 400. So I'm gonna get set up, poke us a hole in that valve cover and I'll show you the process of what I do to get that thing in that aluminum valve cover. And I'll pull that piece out of here and I'm gonna save that because if I decide to cut that 
filler back out of there, I'll be able to use this piece as a filler if I want to weld that hole back up. Because remember what I said, things don't always go as you planned and you might have to reverse. So, just like that, clean up some of my debris. So we're not walking around in it. I cannot emphasize cleaning up your shop enough. I'm telling you. It, it, again, people can do what they want. But, man, I've been in some shops, and these guys were talented. They really knew what they were doing, but their places were a mess. And it puts a hint of doubt in your mind of their capabilities, or let's say you're in a transmission shop and you know these guys are good, but that transmission shop is grungy. Well, the worst thing you can do is get grunge inside your transmission, especially automatic transmissions. So uh, again, keep your shop clean. Keep your shop clean and uh, I'll guarantee you, when people come in, they'll mention how clean it is. Because a lot of folks know how hard it is to keep a place clean when you work in it every day. So, these filler necks are made, I think, to go all the way down to this, all the way down to that little flange right there. We have a lot of rocker arm. There is a lot of rocker arms underneath this thing, and they're big and they're thick. So, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to make this thing flush with the inside of the valve cover so that I don't have anything encroaching down into the cavity where the valve train exists. So we're gonna leave this poked up pretty high. So in order to do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a piece of welding rod and I'm gonna kind of clamp it on the inside so that it prevents our fill bung from dropping all the way down past uh, the in, inside edge of the, uh, of the valve cover. Sometimes that's easier said than done, but we'll get it here. All right, kind of just like that. So we'll fire up our fire up our welding machine again here.
this valve cover, this valve cover is cast, and it's a terrible casting. Uh, it's full of holes, little you know, like little air pockets and things like that. So who knows how this thing's gonna weld? I haven't welded on one of these yet, but uh, it might be kind of grungy, but you know, it, it'll weld okay to where it'll seal. So we'll throw a couple tacks on there and then we'll weld it up. Alright, so I got my first tack on, so I'm going to look underneath and make sure I got the thing placed where I kind of wanted it to, so it's not hanging down into the, into the valve cover. All I did was use a piece of rod and a clamp. And it is, as you can see, it's situated in there just fine to where it's not hanging down. Anytime I'm putting something in that I wanted to say in a certain spot, I always put three tack or <laughs> three. I always put three tacks on. That way it holds it from twisting like this and it maintains that spot where I want it to stay. Alright. And we'll just weld it up. I ran my tungsten out just a little bit more to kind of make sure that I stayed in close to my weld. And it is definitely welding kind of dirty. And some people can say, oh Donnie, it's welding dirty because you're not got enough gas on it or stuff like that. No, man, I can see the stuff cooking out of this valve cover. So, as you can see, see all these holes and pits and stuff that's in this casting? A lot of times that's an indication of, of not a very good casting. So, and I've welded up a ton of those, you know, from transmission cases to boat cases to cylinder heads to intake manifolds, everything you can think of. But see how dirty that is around there? I mean, I wire brushed and cleaned and everything on this thing. But see how dirty and kind of black peppery it is? That's a product of a, of a bad casting, so. But it'll be just fine. It'll hold oil.
Again, I'm still using my stainless steel brush. Aluminum is such, it sucks heat so bad. That's why you got to have a lot of amperage in order to weld thick aluminum, or you have to aid it by adding uh, helium to your, to, your, uh, to your shielding gas. But, okay, I just welded this, and I'm able to touch it, and it's because all that heat is soaking into this aluminum. So... Our cap goes on just fine. I'll put some O-ring, I'll put the O-rings. O-rings are provided with it. I'll put the O-rings on it and uh, this piece will be ready to go to the dyno. On to our next miscalculation. So the next item on the list of things that we have to refine from our original design to go to, uh, in, to, to dyno the engine is we created this more or less like an intake plenum, which slides over all of our velocity stacks that are on top of each of our eight uh, throttle bodies. We're able to look inside, see if we get any kind of, you know, fuel splash or anything coming up out of each throttle body based on, you know, we, we created a certain height of our intake manifolds. And we did that based on where the hood sat. We angled them based on the hood. So we didn't really say, well, we measured things for horsepower or torque. Uh, they're relatively short, which we believe shorter for what we're doing is better. We're going to find out when, once we run the thing. But we wanted to measure air going into the engine. In order to run the management system that we are, the electromotive that's on the, the engine right now, we needed to be able to check ambient air temperature. This is our air temperature sensor. It plugs in. Air comes in through the top of this box. And when I originally built it, I thought that the intake tube or the tube that is the ductwork going to the dyno, I thought that thing was this big. I was wrong. It's this big. So I'm going to make this attach to this. This attaches to that ductwork. So I have this piece which is going to get welded on. Then this piece is going to be bent around this hole and then this slides over it and then a clamp goes around it and clamps it all together. So that's my next, that's the next thing that I got to fix to get our process going. So the best way to roll this into a radius or into a circle so that we can weld it onto here is you would use a roller. A three, like a three, like a three ring or a three, three tube roller to where you would just keep running it through those three rolls, tighten it, and then it creates that radius. I don't have one of those, so I'll have to find a different way to do it. And you guys get to watch me figure it out. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll find something that's close to this size and then I'll bend around it. Welding tanks work real good for that.
lot of times with aluminum, all you got to do is get it close with a cut, and then you can bend it and break it. I mean, it's a time saver. Uh, it's up to you. So, again, the, the welding tank got me close. This is another one of those situations where you want to take your time. Because you don't want, for what I'm trying to do, I don't want, like, kinks or, like, hard, you know, hard bends or angles. I want it to have a nice, smooth radius. Because, again, we're, we're kind of trying to catch that airflow. So, we want it to seal. So, I got it pretty close. If I'd have done the math, I could figure out what the total length was because it's, uh, it's diameter times pi or something like that. Uh, or, or, yeah, I think it's diameter times pi. I could be wrong. Leave it in the comments, you know, what uh, maybe what I should have did. <laughs>
there is a mathematical formula how to do this. It's just that I didn't do it. Again, Irwin clamps, the long ones. Oh man, these things are great. Now, by no means anything that I do here am I saying is the right way. The stuff that I do is the way I do it. But I've learned to do things by watching other people, as I mentioned earlier. And what I do is I take pieces of what they did and I create my own way. So what you might do is you might go, oh, that's a good idea. And then that other thing that he does is a terrible idea. You combine it with what you're doing and you end up with a better idea. Now, I'm kind of guessing here a little bit. I'm guessing that I'm close enough that it'll work. So I'm gonna throw a couple tacks on this thing. Matter of fact, I'm gonna weld it up because then I can kind of reform it, put it over my hole and see if it's gonna work. Again, take your char rechargeable or take your uh, battery operated stuff off your table. And remember, aluminum gets hot, and if you let it get too close to your plastic pads, it'll melt, it'll melt them.
Some people would say use a rubber mallet. I use thunder and lightning. That's a movie quote. All right, I'm gonna go to the grinder and clean this weld off a little bit so that my clamp goes over that real quick and then we'll weld this thing in place. I was probably chopping my head off again. I'm gonna clean this off so that we can weld it in place. So the weakest part of this ring that I just created at this point is where I welded it together because I just sanded through that weld joint which on aluminum, you got to always make sure that you're really deep all the way through your material if you're going to weld, if you're going to grind that off. Because part of the strength of that weld is that over, you know, that that over weld that or whatever you call it that is above the surface of where you welded. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to put this in place. And then I'm going to weld on both sides of that weld to tack the thing down. There is equipment, machinery, and tools that make this process a whole lot easier. You know, you can bend a nice radius, you know, nice circle in a roller and all that. I just don't have that kind of stuff. And you're not going to have some of the stuff that you need to do some of the stuff that you want to do. So then you improvise. And again, you can learn more. I think learning more is like when I started to, when I learned how to weld, I, I learned how to weld on like gold stars and synchro waves. And the arrow wave was in existence and it would make you a hero because it was so easy to weld with. And these are Miller products. So the guy who was teaching me how to aluminum weld, he started me off on the most antiquated machine and helped me get good on it. So then when I moved to the really good stuff, uh, I was even better. So like I say, sometimes bending this stuff by hand and using your hammer and all that, it helps you and you'll be way better when you get the piece of equipment that does it correctly.
sometimes your clamps come off. Because <laughs> that metal moves around a little bit whenever you heat it up like that. So, again, didn't mess me up, but be prepared for stuff like that. This thing doesn't have to be perfect, but if you can try to make it perfect, it helps you the next time when it needs to be perfect. So don't discount anything that you do, but if you practice making stuff the best you can, then when the real deal comes around, you'll be better at it. A couple more tacks and then I'll just weld this thing all the way around. And that's what we were looking for. We'll put a clamp on that and it'll kind of, you know, seal it because we want to try to reduce the air in leakage that we create. All right, I'm just gonna weld that up. Now, when I weld around the center of this, what it's gonna do is it's gonna make these edges come up a little bit. For our application and what we're doing with this box, it ain't gonna hurt us a bit. People ask me why I run my rods down so short. That's money right there. Uh, I used to buy a lot of this stuff, hundreds of pounds at a time. And I got used to running them all the way down to the end because that is all things you have to buy. And as you can see, it warped it up a little bit, but it's aluminum and it, it comes back real nice. So all welded up, I'm gonna cool the thing off so that we can get it put on top of our plenum.
we do, I, always, I did a lot of fabrication, so I have a lot of different clamps. And clamps will help you in everything that you do in auto, you know, automobile fabrication. And that's primarily what we do now is we just mess with these old cars. So I say also in some of the stuff that you want to acquire and you can do it a little piece at a time, get you good clamps. There's a lot of different widths of wire from 16 to 332nd to 8th. I used to do everything with 8th inch wire. I mean, if I was welding on, shoot, it could be interior sheet metal, I'd be using 8th inch wire and aluminum. Uh, my brother always liked using this 332 rod and it kind of got me to using it. And I primarily use 332 rod on anything that I'm doing that's in, that's relatively sh thin sheet now. As you can see, I got it all tacked on things relatively nice and straight. Aluminum is going to pull around on you. You know, if you don't have tacks really close, sometimes it'll sag out and you'll get up with a gap. Uh, again, for our purpose, I think we're going to be just fine. So I'm going to go ahead. One thing I want to make sure I don't do is I don't heat the thing up too much because I don't want to melt my, my plastic covers. Uh, so I'm going to kind of bounce around, maybe cool it off a little bit, but I'm going to weld the thing up.
again, normally I wouldn't be too concerned, but I just don't want to melt those plastic panels. I don't want to have to redo that. So I've done a lot of welding in my time. So uh, if you've got any questions or any comments, please make comments. And uh, don't forget to subscribe too, because uh, we do have a lot of stuff planned. So if you subscribe, uh, kind of helps me to you know, know that more people are interested. And then if you leave comments, tell me what you're looking for. Um, I mean, we've got a, between the people that I know and you know, people that come into the shop, I have a vast, vast array of people that have a lot of knowledge. And uh, if you've got a question, I can try to get it answered. So our plenum is all welded. I guess we're gonna call this a plenum. It's all welded up. And I'm gonna put the welding machine away because I don't think we need it anymore today. I definitely don't mind constructive criticism or ideas. So please, if you see something that you think I could do better, or if you have an idea, well, you know, please let me know. The one thing that I can confirm, I don't know enough and I need to learn more. So, and I think that probably pertains to all of us. So please, you know, mention things in the comments. There we go. Put a clamp on there. Problem remedied. Okay, we'll put this on the stack of stuff that we got to take with us this afternoon.